Okay, we're back. Principles of test construction. Um, in these principles, we're going to be mostly talking about the kinds of normed tests that we would administer as intelligence tests. But there's a certain, to a certain degree, when teachers make up tests, they follow a lot of these principles. And when psychologists invent new personality scales or um, attitude tests, we follow these principles as well. This first principle, however, is pretty much reserved for the normed tests that are um, standardized um, IQ tests and other kinds of employment tests and things like that. Because for standardization to occur, we have to get uh, a group of people to take the test who are not really test takers, but they're there to help us serve as um, a standardization sample. And that allows us to interpret an individual's score by comparing it to the performance of others who have taken the test before. So in standardization, we have to recruit a group of people who are fundamentally like the people who are really going to take the test. So if we're standardizing for the intelligence test that we're developing, and we want to try and use this test for all Americans, we're going to want to make sure that we recruit a sample that includes the correct demographic characteristics that will correctly represent the American test taker. So we would recruit on purpose in the proper proportions um, of race, age, sex, you know, these kinds of variables that might in impact or might be important for um, performance on an intelligence test. And then we, that way, we can, when we have an individual score, we can compare them to the correct group, the group that they should be being compared to. So that's what we mean by standardization. Now, of course, for making up a test in class, I don't have access to a group of people who aren't my students, who I can administer the test to so I can know what my students should do on the test. So this is reserved for those kinds of tests that are really big, really expensive, um, high stakes, you know, a lot of a lot of um, decisions might be ma made based on how a person performs, that kind of thing. Now, standardization allows us to um, place an individual relative to everybody else um, in, in large proportion because intelligence is normally distributed in the population. What that means is that most people are going to cluster around the average and relatively fewer are going to be in the outlying areas. So what we're looking at right here is a, a depiction of a normal curve that's representing um, scores on the Wechsler intelligence test. And um, I don't want to get all statistical on you, but the basic idea is the average score is 100. We already discussed that before. One standard deviation away from the mean is 15 points. This is um, when you have a normally distributed characteristic, then you know that one standard deviation away from the mean will include a total of 68% of people. One, one standard deviation below the mean to one standard deviation above the mean. So through administering the Wechsler intelligence test, the Stanford Binet test, things like that, we've established that 68% um, of people will score between 85 and 115 on an IQ test. Um, so another almost 14% will fall one more standard deviation above or below. So 70 to 85 IQ will include about 13.5% of the population. 115 to 130 will include another 13.5%. So by the time you've gotten two standard deviations away from the mean, 95% of people in the population will fall within that range between 70 and 130. So the vast majority of people are within that range. And then you have the, the outliers, the people who are scoring in the very rare categories, above 130 and below 70. And then you get into the really rare, and that's above 145 or below 150, uh, below 55. So um, this is what a normal curve does. Um, it tells us what percentage of people will fall within particular ranges. And uh, intelligence is normally distributed, so we're able to use standardization to determine what the actual score is that's associated with each of the standard deviations. And then that way, when you take the test and you score, well, you obviously are going to score, you know, 126. We can um, compare it to the normal curve here, 
and see that you're falling two standard deviations away. You're falling not quite two standard deviations away. You're between 115 and 130. So you're in the reasonably normal range. You're above average, but um, you're not in the way outlying areas. And uh, so that's how we can interpret your scores, by comparing you to all the people who have taken it before and they've made this normal curve. Another principle when we're creating tests is that we would like them to be reliable. Um, reliability refers to the test's ability to generate consistent results. So if you were to take the Stanford Binet when you were two, which is the youngest age you can take it, um, I've never seen a two-year-old take the Stanford Binet. I have heard of a three-year-old who took it, however, and so, but I, I didn't see how they took the test because, my goodness, that must be um, challenging <laughs> to say the least to get a three-year-old to pay attention. But uh, let's say you took it when you were two and then you took it again when you were 22. Your score should be reasonably close to the same for those two testing uh, test administrations. Because the test is so reliable, it consistently yields the same basic score for an individual across time. Um, now, of course, the test adjusts for age, so that's why you know you can score the same basic score at two, even though you got hardly any questions right when you were two, um, and you got a lot more questions right when you were 22, the scaling, because you're being compared to others who have taken the test before, um, stays consistent. So what we want to look for in a good test is it should be reliable. Now, some of you might set your clocks ahead. I, I know I do. I set my clock in my bathroom ahead so that I always think it's a little later than it really is while I'm getting dressed. So I'll kind of hustle it up and not be late. Um, it is reliably always the same amount of time fast. Uh, frankly, I've forgotten how much. Somewhere between two and five minutes, I'm not exactly sure. Um, depends on, you know, like when I recently changed the battery and stuff like that. But I know that my clock is some amount fast. I can count on that. So if I do look over at it and I think, oh, I'm late, I remind myself, okay, got a couple of minutes, which is such a weird trick. I don't know why I bother to do it if I know that it's ahead. <laughs> but anyway, I know that my clock is reliably, let's be honest, it's wrong, reliably wrong. Um, it's always time plus X. So that's really the crux of the issue with intelligence testing. Yeah, I just made this great ca case that intelligence tests are highly reliable, but that doesn't mean that they're valid. It doesn't mean that they're actually measuring what they cl are supposed to be measuring. Um, I know my clock is not validly measuring time. It's producing time plus x. It's reliable. Every time I look at it, it's time plus x. But it's not valid. That's not what time it is. Um, so when you get the same score on the Stanford Binet when you're 2 and when you're 22, that's good. The test is reliable. But is it measuring what it's claiming to measure. Is it measuring intelligence? It's possible it could be measuring something else like test taking ability or knowledge of the culture, you know, having been immersed in it, right? Or just facility with language that isn't necessarily representative of deeper intelligence, right? So it, what is intelligence is really the question, right? We may get reliable results, but what are we measuring? What is intelligence? And like I said at the very beginning of this section, you know, we have not in psychology agreed about what intelligence is. So what I'm going to present for you is a series of, you know, sort of back and forth, um, the different perspectives. And you can agree with whichever side you seem you think makes the most logic, but just you need to know what the what the premises are. Okay, so first off, is intelligence culturally defined? A lot of people complain that um, the intelligence tests that are on the market uh, favor members of certain cultures or subcultures um, and that we could never trust the tests to produce valid results for everybody who we might administer it to and certainly not for um, taking it to other cultures around the world and just with some translations expected to work. So let's get into that little argument. So first we have that side, the yes side. Yes, it's culturally defined. These folks point to the fact that what is considered intelligent behavior differs by culture. It's whatever the culture values. That's what they call intelligence. So in the US, we value verbal skills and mathematics. And so if you're good at those things, you know, if you're logical, 
those are things we value, and so if you're good at those, then we call you intelligent. If you instead were raised in a hunter-gatherer group in Africa, you're, you would be considered intelligent if you had um, the skill set to avoid being bitten by stinging ants while you were crouched in the bushes waiting for uh, you know an animal that you were hunting to come by. In fact, it's so valued that when the young men come of age and are eligible to go on their first hunt, they um, all the boys who have come of age since the last year um, are placed in nests of biting ants and the ones who emerge with the fewest bites are deemed the most intelligent in their age cohort. Um, that doesn't seem like an intelligence test to, an, to a Westerner, but it's what is valued in that culture. And so they think that's a good measure. I'd like to point out it's kind of a reaction time test, which is part of, um, you know, westernized intelligence testing also. So maybe they're onto something. I would prefer to, you know, take a pa paper and pencil test than get bit by stinging ants, but that's just me. Um, these folks who take the yes side say it would be impossible to develop a culture-free test, and so we probably should just quit trying. That we should recognize that around the world, different cultures should have different intelligence tests that represent content that is, um, you know, il illustrative of what they value in their culture. So every culture should have their own intelligence test and their own metric for deciding who's the most, who has a lot of intelligence, who's lacking intelligence in their culture. Uh, and in fact, these, this side of the argument even points out that within the U.S. we have subcultures that are more or less, um, you know, enmeshed in what the larger culture values. If you're from a subculture that doesn't value language and math, but instead values street smarts or instead values knowing when it's time to plant your crop, then you're going to have you know, a person who doesn't perform very well on the standard intelligence test, but might do very well in their um, niche in the in the larger society. Now, of course, there are the people who say, no, it's not culturally defined. Um, that everybody, you know, that we should be able to come up with an intelligence test that everybody could take. Um, people who take this perspective say um, that intelligence, and I'm sorry, I shortened it to IQ to make sure it fit, but um, IQ intelligence is really measuring a basic set of problem solving skills. That it's really the same strategy that allows you to get the stinging ants off of you quickly that underlies your ability to solve math problems. That it's really problem solving is problem solving. The problem may take different forms, but you know the same um, intellect goes behind coming up with strategies to solve the problem. Um, this side of the argument points out that the, there is a pretty small correlation between a person's IQ and then how well they end up doing in their um, field of employment. And that's important because generally, um, you know, people who earn more or gain status should be the people who have the, the skills that are valued by the culture, right? But that's not necessarily the case. We claim in our culture by using IQ tests that measure math, verbal skills, and logic, we claim that those are things that we value, and that's why we um, measure them. But then in our culture, as far as who we show great value to, like who we give a lot of money to or status to, um, oftentimes that's not people who score well on those tests. You know, it might be athletes, it might be actors. You know, you know it's not necessarily, now I'm not saying actors and athletes can't score high on an IQ test. I'm just saying that the skill that they're being valued for is largely independent of whether they score well on an IQ test or not. Now, of course, the, the, um, the no side says that I, intelligence is really a basic set of problem solving skills, so maybe we can use the test to establish how much of those problem solving skills you have. And then out in the real world, it's not really that we pay you well because you have great language skills, but instead we pay you if you can use those language skills to entertain us, right? And that's a, that's a type of intelligence. It's a type of problem solving capability. So, I mean, these two arguments are not necessarily mutually exclusive, and they're not necessarily um, you know, completely consistent in their own logic. Um, but anyway, so yeah, we definitely have a debate going on. How about this debate? Is it inherited? Talk about your hot button issues. So please forgive me, I'm only repeating the research and stuff like that. I'm not sharing my personal opinion on anything um, here. The yes side of the debate says that um, if we look at twins, we see that, um, in fact, I think I have a picture here. Um, Identical twins um, share 
IQ scores most of the time. In fact, if we compare identical twins who were reared apart, they didn't even share their environment growing up, to fraternal twins who were reared together, we see that identical twins are much more similar in their IQs. This um, graphic is showing us a few things. First off, let's remind ourselves that identical twins share 100% of their genes. They started out as one fertilized egg that split. Um, fraternal twins share 50% of their genes. They started off as two separate eggs that each got fertilized and then they um, shared the womb together. Okay, so just that's terminology. Now if you look at the y-axis, it says similarity of intelligence scores, and that's a correlation. This is what we call concordance scores. It's a measure of how much the, um, the individuals match on their scores. So if I knew one of the identical twins' IQ scores, I would be about 72% likely to be correct if I just assumed that the other twin had the same score. Whereas with fraternal twins, I'd only be 60% right. Now that's not enormous, but it's statistically significant. There is a difference. And those are among the identical twins who are reared apart versus the fraternal twins reared together. If we look at the far left column, identical twins reared together, they've got 86% concordance rates. So if you compare 86 to 60, now all of us can agree, okay, there's a lot more in common among the twins, identical twins who share 100% of their genes um, than among the fraternal twins who only share 50% of their genes. So twins clearly provide us some evidence that suggests that there might be a genetic component to intelligence. We can also do the flip side and look at people who were adopted into families. Adopted children tend to, by the time they're about 16, when we administer IQ tests to them, to their adoptive parents who raised them, and to their biological parents who didn't raise them but gave birth to them, we find that the adopted children's IQs are, share much more concordance with their biological parents than with their adoptive parents. Um, if we look at um, this graphic, we have three-year-olds, we tested them at three years of age, and then we tested them again at 16 years of age. Um, with the teal column, we have children who are raised by their birth parents. So like regular children who were raised by their regular parents. Okay. The red column is the adopted children and then their birth parents who did not raise them. And then in the blue column we have the adopted children and then their adoptive parents who raised them. And what you see is at three years old the, chil the children who are being raised by their biological parents have the most match with their parents. But the adopted kids there's really no correlation with either set of parents. But by 16 suddenly you notice that the adopted children and their concordance with their biological parents is indistinguishable from children who are being raised by their birth parents. And then here you have the adopted children and their cor correlation with their adoptive parents being completely negligible. It's zero, really. Um, this evidence suggests that genes tend to win out in the expression of um, intelligence. Now let's notice those concordance rates on the Y, on the y chromosome, <laughs> that's funny, Y axis, um, you'll notice it's not even quite to 35%. So yeah, it's, not, it's nowhere near like comparing identical twins with their identical sibling. That's, it's nowhere near that. It's not even like comparing two fraternal twins when you're comparing children with their parents, whether they're biological or not. Um, so the correlation is not great in any circumstance, but it is definitely better if you, um, you look at a child and then whoever gave them their biological destiny. All right, but then we can also use that same chart that I showed you a second ago to make the no case that it's not inherited. Um, if we, first off, if we talk about kids who are neglected, um, and I'm not talking about kids whose parents didn't have enough books in the house. I'm talking about kids who undergo significant neglect and they aren't fed properly. Um, no one talks to them all day. Um, sometimes kids who have been neglected, you know, when they get rescued, they, they're they toddlers and they've like sucked all the skin off their thumb because no one's fed them and they've just been sucking their thumb all day. That kind of thing. I'm talking about that. Um, neglect like that has been associated with reductions in intelligence. It interferes with healthy development. So when you can see that you can alter a person's um, intelligence by depriving them of normal interactions, it kind of suggests that the environment plays a role, right? Um, if we look at this, the twins again, and we compare, let's just focus on the identicals. 
the ones who are reared together are more similar than the ones who are reared apart. That suggests an environment plays some role, right? Because sharing an environment um, increases the concordance rate between the identical twins by almost the same amount as being an identical versus a fraternal, right? So it kind of implies that there's there's got to be some role in uh, in the environment. In fact, uh, I didn't put a box around it, but if we shift our gaze to the other part of the graph that doesn't have a box around it, if we look at fraternal twins reared together and then regular siblings reared together. Now they share the same amount of genetic overlap. Fraternal twins and siblings both share about 50% of their genes. They're both reared together, so they should have a lot of environmental overlap. The difference is that fraternal twins, for one thing, shared the womb. So maybe the environment in the womb is a really important time for the shaping of the brain and things like that so that um, the twins, ha you know, having shared the environment makes them more similar to each other. Then there's also once you're born, when you're a fraternal twin, you oftentimes get sort of treated like a unit. You're called the twins, right? And you, you oftentimes have a lot of very similar experiences. Uh, my son had some buddies who were identical twins, but um, he actually liked one of them better. You know, they were better friends. And so he wanted to just invite the one over. And uh, when my, when another friend of his found out that Aspen had only invited one of the twins over, the parent of another friend was like, well, I mean, how can you do that? Don't you have to invite both of them? And it's like, why? But she's thinking of them as a unit. They have to go together. How can you have an experience without your identical twin brother? And that's oftentimes what happens with twins, is that everybody gets treated exactly the same in a way that regular siblings don't. And then I also want to throw in that regular siblings are at least nine months different in age, and that has an effect. So, um, you know, environment certainly must play some kind of role. Because you notice this nice, neat little stair-stepping, if we take the box off. If you look at that nice stair-stepping. From the far left, we've got identical twins reared together, 100% of genes in common, and then this shared the, the womb and shared their environment once they were born. Take a step down of approximately 12 points when you go to identical twins, but they weren't reared together. Then another 12-point loss of concordance when we say, okay, now you're going to be reared together and share the womb together, but you only share half of your genes. And then another roughly 12 point drop when we say, okay, same amount of genes in common, still being reared together, but did not share the womb at the same time and are different ages. And then we have the final column, which is unrelated people who are being reared together. So like people who are adopted into the household. So you don't share any genes in common and then you have, uh, you know, just household overlap. And again, we've lost another 12 points approximately. So you see this beautiful little stair step, which makes it seem like both environment and uh, genes probably play a role. Um, okay, so then let's go ahead and take a little break and we'll come back about and talk about why there are differences among groups on intelligence scores. <laughs>